Okay, so start recording here. Great. So we're here with Eugene Kim, Kim now. Did you start to, to coin the term collaborative literacy? I mean, I, as far as I know, I have not heard anyone else. I did not hear someone use it beforehand, but, you know, you never know. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, we're, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, that's a critical thing. Like, we're finding that culturally, like in a world of open source hardware where we live in, uh, that kind of literacy is a real block for many people in terms of mm. what it's not like when we're working on open hardware it's not the anything with technology it's with social technology it's the collaborative mm. literacy that's the issue that we run into I can so, imagine yeah. yeah yeah well I want to hear more about how you're using the term and how you're trying to teach it it sounds like you're you're actively with these camps trying to actually support people in developing it yeah we are uh, let me actually, uh, maybe I'll start with giving, get, getting you a link to um, a YouTube video on Tabai. On the first day, a couple of days ago, we just did a presentation on the overall picture of collaborative literacy for large-scale collaboration in hardware. So let me... Oh, cool. Let me uh, send you that link. Uh, take a look at that uh, YouTube. So I, I loved it when I saw it on your, on your site. It's like CC0. Mm -hmm. I love it. <laughs> yeah, we definitely, uh, I, I've been enjoying, I heard about your project many years ago, and so it was cool that you uh, reached out, and I really kind of dived in a little bit to see what you're up to, and definitely a lot of values alignment. And I'm not a hardware guy, so right. I'm particularly intrigued by, right now it's you know, time to by talk some about. of the stuff you've been learning and doing and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, let me just uh, get this out of the way here again. Yeah. Get this video. Okay, so take it's recording uh, using OBI. There we go. Yeah, so take a look at that. Um, that's kind of like the big picture. Let's see, did that come through there? YouTube video. Um, oh, there we go. You can uh, scan through that. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So we actively teach about what kind of mindset and what kind of tool set you need to have in order to engage in large-scale collaboration on hardware because uh, there's a project we're going to launch next year which is uh, designing the world's first professional grade open source 3d printed cordless drill it's going to be an incentive challenge on hero x but unlike like i was blown away by hero x so that's a collaborative uh, kind, of, kind of a collaborative design platform but when i looked at it it's zero percent collaborative like once again the rules are set such that mm. it's a hundred teams competing with one another and mm. once again falling into that trap let's see am i is my video uh, cut out yeah right? i okay. see it now. okay um falling into that trap where instead of co everybody collaborating and and working on a bigger problem than ourselves it's like we're still competing so part of our mm. Um, debut there with a the cordless drill will be that the rules will be okay everybody is required to upload and download and review other people's stuff and and work as a team so we, we're going to design all those rules to be uh, for optimizing collaboration which I was kind of blown away to see that all those projects in there I could not find one that mm. where people were collaborating mm. or that the results were open source uh, the mm. closest was actually Mozilla which was not collaborative because people were competing for whatever the, their challenge was and it was partly open source because they didn't require the submissions themselves to be open source only the winning submission would be open source so Got it. that kind of deal uh, so mm. we, we pay a lot of a lot of attention to the mm -hmm. open source thing where that's core to our culture because we think that of course we can change the world in a profound way like software with hardware um, but that requires a new kind of awareness that the rules of patents and all of that that's that's not uh, the way things are it's just, it's a human construct yeah like yeah that, that's really cool I, you know so i don't know what you want to talk on this call i'd love to hear more just about your story where that ethic kind of comes from for you yeah you know and just how things have been going yeah 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 so the ethic comes from so i did get a phd in fusion energy and discovered i was useless uh that kind of deal um have you seen my TED talk, by the way? I saw the TED talk. Yeah. So I, I talked briefly about that, and uh, mm -hmm. the idea was that you know, I always wanted to do good things with with technology, but farther I went in the school system, the less useful I felt. So the last 
year of my PhD program, I started open source ecology. Now, why did I do that? There were two mm-hmm. formative events. For one, somebody in my group showed me Linux. I've never heard about it at that time. Mm-hmm. This was uh, t- around 2000 or so. Uh, I said, wow, that's that's cool. Something that's different, that's free, that's collaborative. Uh, that kind of piqued my interest. And I saw how people worked in, in our research program. And I actually wasn't able to talk openly about the work that I was doing. And I noticed that it's like, wow, this is not right. We're at a public institution. What's going on here? And, and I thought that, well, if that happens here, it must happen everywhere. And there must be all this competitive waste happening. And I said, wow, um, that's not right. And what would the world look like if we really collaborated? So those kinds of thoughts really started burbling up. And then, uh, so first thing I wanted to do after that is uh, not, not you know, quit academia and just start to just really get out there entrepreneurially. To, to get out there into the world. And that was to get some land and start a civilization reboot experiment. I found that tools were needed and missing, open source, affordable, fixable tools. Uh, that was badly missing in the whole th- whole endeavor. So I, like, I took on some agriculture activity, but I found you can't really get the best practices nor affordable tools to get that operation going. So that's when I said, okay, let's open source uh, the, the tools and techniques started with building housing like this is the facility here we there was nothing here it was just a bare piece of land so we built some infrastructure and uh, started going from that but noticing that okay uh, it's really hard to do that because of the cost and things break down and in school you know graduating from college I thought oh yeah with a PhD program I was like oh yeah I'm ready and then you get the reality of what it means to do farm and then uh, all the practical things there so that's kind of the nutshell of it, and, and uh, formulated the Global Village Construction Set idea in 2008 after a few years on the land, saying, okay, let's nail the, the society's technical infrastructure so that people don't have to struggle with it to make a living, and life is easy. So um, the eventual goal is kind of, once again, the kind of the post-scarcity, let's evolve to freedom, let's think about what's after uh, when making a living is no longer an issue for people because right now you know we don't believe in any of these material uh scarcities that are that the economy plays out it's still a very much power concentrative economy so we're we talk about the idea of a distributive economy how do you design into the system that you're sharing and giving power away to people in the first place as opposed to trickle down and things like that so unleashing tools of productivity and the sharing knowledge is the general idea yeah and how familiar were you with farming and just building in general before you started diving into this world? In farming, I, I, w- I did some urban gardening in Madison, so I went to school in Madison mm-hmm. and uh, did that. was was great. I saw things just grew like crazy on the streets. I did uh, like planting trees in people's backyards, just kind of distributed thing where mm-hmm. uh, we would like share the, share the produce and stuff. So just a little bit of experience with that, uh, not much at all. As far as building things, really nothing, because in a PhD program, I, you know, you don't do your machining or any building. Typically, uh-huh. it was it was an experimental program, but typically you let the machinist guys do that, and you just sit behind the computer screen and designing things. So no, n- not not at all the hands-on experience, and just learned it. I mean, it's really a passion to learn because you had to learn it, and you know, to build the the brick press, the first thing machine we built, the tractors and things. That we do right now. That's uh, I believe that we can't have a democratic society without people knowing more about being more closely tied to the life support systems and natural resources that feed yeah. us. It's like it's super important, and that's kind of what we work on. I can yeah, I can imagine like just now the the awareness and the the appreciation for what you're doing is so heightened because people are more conscious of just where we are you know societally speaking uh, environmentally speaking Um, and i'm also just curious about like i mean you said so you started this in like the early 2000s like yeah yeah 2004 was when uh open source ecology the, the project was started yeah and how much different is like the technology and the accessibility in terms of like the 3d printing for example the cost like is it order of magnitudes difference from now between when you started or yeah like when we started in 2004 yeah the printers were that was not that was like the early days of that right now we're pretty much building off all the open source technology through the RepRap project which uh yeah so right now i mean we're 
right now as we're speaking we're designing the new versions of the printer and other kits for education and for running steam camps but that's completely built on open source and when we started that the particular 3d printing stuff yeah that just was not there yet so that mm -hmm. we're certainly benefiting from the community the other things like tractors or brick presses nobody's doing it i mean we're just uh, uh designing uh so not a lot of prior art in terms of where we can borrow directly yeah uh, yeah to make it all up basically yeah. figure it all out from the beginning really Pretty cool much. And so how much farming are you doing now? Are you still doing it or are you all invested in the, uh, the OSC stuff? Uh, the idea is that we build, uh, the long-term plan is to build campuses. So this is like mm -hmm. the initial seeds of, uh, of an education facility. So agriculture, production, living, working, uh, all of that will be built in. Uh, a couple of days ago, we just harvested 115 pounds of fish from our aquaponics system. <laughs> so we still have... A, a bit of that going we shut that down for the next iteration for next year we've got a bunch of permaculture apple trees and uh lots of different trees planted out um but right now we're at the stage okay let's get some enterprise activity going around like the 3d printer the education we're getting much more into the uh, we will be getting starting up the agriculture pretty much like next year with our own equipment in a major way uh, so all this time we've actually been developing the enabling tools. So initially started full-time agriculture pretty much, uh, learned that, okay, we need some tools. So spend the next few, until now essentially, prototyping, doing like 10 years of experiments on everything from building houses to building tractors to 3D printers, torch tables, uh, building out agriculture systems, aquaponic greenhouses, and then a lot of, a lot of different stuff that's experimental. But now uh, trying to integrate that into working business models, get this as a real good working farm. Uh, but we're finding out, like right now, we're transitioning to the fact that, okay, uh, there's one major ingredient that a lot of open source projects have missed, and that's called product <laughs> or, or financial feedback loop. So we're really working on that. Right now, we're, we're, you can say we're working on a business as opposed to on a product. Uh, so yeah, understanding finally that, yes, it's time for both if we're ever going to scale. So right, uh, right. that kind of deal. But yes, we're definitely going back to the, uh, if we talk about the agriculture, the long answer to that is yes, we will build that in um, as far as a real working infrastructure of the community that we have here. Uh, uh -huh. So you can think about it as a university campus most closely because um, we're planning on building. So there's infrastructure for living, for working, for production for um, agriculture so it's all going to be uh, an integrated facility like you have agri hoods starting the concept of an agri hood no, which is that. take the average cookie cutter development and add agriculture to it so so uh, where that becomes part of the business model in there got um, it yeah. got it um how large is your core community um core community is like a dozen people that are pretty much continuing developers i mean there's hundreds of people or thousands on the wiki and stuff uh, altogether but active development no like we haven't con continuity is a big issue obviously uh -huh. in, a, in a an open source project we did not get like like linux to come about i don't know how long a decade or so to to get fully corporate sponsored but right now we're still at the very early stages so we're trying to just build up the, the enterprise infrastructure to make it happen but throughout the years i mean that's the big missing link is the enterprise part uh -huh. um, and that's kind of like from my perspective, I've you know been out there, out here, living at low cost, so we can afford it in terms of low cost existence and just prototyping. So the last mm -hmm. decade has been like all hundreds of prototypes of everything um, adding up, but now really getting to, okay, let's get some traction out of this so we can actually have people making livelihoods out of it. Because one thing that yeah. uh, really shocked me was, like even when we did the brick press in 2008 first, nobody started a business on that list there's nobody there's very few replications that have happened i mean there are some but but nobody that i know of really that's running a business using our stuff which is that's i mean that's that's what's supposed to happen ah uh, right but it's not, not right yet. so we're working on that part where do you see the uh at the low-hanging fruit in terms of market do you think it's in this country do you think it's abroad oh i think it's in this country because because when you go into a, go abroad you're talking about much more complexity that I don't think we we have a lot of authority to negotiate at this point. 
I'd say we're quite familiar with what goes on in the States. Right now we're going after the education market with the, the business model we've been developing is extreme manufacturing workshops. So the workshop model where people build stuff rapidly, like say they build a printer, 3D printer in a day and take it home. We did workshops where you do a house build in five days or an aquaponic greenhouse build. We've got a, a CB micro house build in Belize coming up in February. So people sign up for that and that's how we get paid. Um, We've been doing a workshop model and now focusing on around steam education. So we do this open source micro factory uh, steam camps uh -huh. um, That kind of thing. Let me sh actually sh send you a link to a promo video of our last one Just to see I saw that actually Yeah, so the steam camps is what we're doing um, Trying to develop that as a full business model that can scale so right now um, Our next step on it. We're actually hiring a uh, a manager um, an event planner so that we can scale the camps because we've got enough substance there that we think we can take it to many locations so we've been uh, cultivating a team of uh, potential instructors and next year we aim to start uh, basically like 12 or up to 24 events in parallel in different urban centers where we're all collab first of all learning the boot camp of open source collaborative design and then doing some project builds for five days or so 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 uh, imagine like an army of 500 people in many locations so we're actually using that as a means to uh, do the product development that we do so so the difference between us is like it's not just some random steam stuff it's uh, products and real deal that makes a difference so um, that's we're rolling that out as a as a business model that can sustain us I think we've got some good ideas on how to do that so that's our main kind of uh, revenue generating activity that we're developing right now outside of producing starting to produce kits so mm -hmm. right now we're in this uh, open source micro factory startup camp where we're uh, deploying basically publishing the the kits for sale uh, and basically uh, doing the enterprise development part during this startup camp right now that's that's kind of where we are but I do definitely see this like I think the Western world I mean that's where the money like we're you know we've exported the white culture all over the world uh, we're kind of like leading it we I think the change has got to happen here because um, I, I really can tell you that yeah if we're going elsewhere a lot of complexity and you know, there's a lot of a lot of issues of course with aid like the the white man's burden the book right I don't know if you've heard about it yeah uh, yeah like that that kind of stuff like yeah a lot of people ask us that question but I think we got to start at home like we got to change our city, Maysville, Missouri, thousand people, you know, uh, meth labs er, and, and commercial agriculture erosion. You know, it's kind of depressed here. We got to start here, you know. So that's, that's our target market is like, well, get the people through the education sector, yeah. um, get the funding there. But uh -huh. we want to have impact. I mean, it's about local communities and bringing production back, back to local communities and all that. Yeah. Really interesting. So you think that people in these communities, like if they get trained up, they'll see that there are potential business opportunities for them at a much lower cost than if they were going to try and do it through kind of traditional means. And hopefully they'll start up businesses and that will feed, that will like prove the model out and will prove what you're trying to do and exactly. hopefully generate a bigger market. Exactly. And specifically, we, we do talk a lot about the open source micro factory basically like i mean you must have heard of the the fab labs by neil gershenfeld yeah MIT. Uh -huh. uh, that stuff uh it's basically the open source version of that where mm. the focus is on production for common people i think the space that the fab labs take is like oh here's you can do this cool project in this expensive top-down funded lab that doesn't have an economic model attached to it uh, we're sourcing talent from there that there are people who can teach our steam camps but we want to apply that to uh tangible development so basically the open source equipment version of that because the fab labs are largely proprietary equipment so the costs are higher we're talking about micro factories that are 100 percent open source tool chains free cad wikis open source 3d printers torch tables cnc machines and all that um where it's affordable and yes it can then re reinvigorate and entrepreneurial activity yeah that's really cool i mean it's a i can imagine it must be really challenging you know it's just that barrier to entry right like with the linux software it's easy right i can 
get engaged with it right now. I just yeah. need the knowledge. But there's like a much higher, you know, startup cost if I want to get involved in this kind of thing. Yeah, 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 definitely. That's that's a huge challenge. That's greater than the the software thing. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, I was thinking about well, okay, so Linux now has shown an absolute clear case where Microsoft is now the biggest supporter of open source. Yeah, so like, crazy. Crazy. Which you know, think yeah. about five or ten years ago, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, so night and day. Yet when you talk talk about hardware, like just nobody sees it. Everyone says, "Oh yeah, investors, patents." Uh, top down, like all of that, they're, they're just not seeing it. And I think the thinking about it, I think we had identified that it's the 200 years of proprietary industrial revolution culture. Uh, hardware has always been proprietary from the earliest mm -hmm. days, whereas software mm -hmm. actually started in open source right. in the 50s. Then it uh, was kind of open source, kind of closed up a bit. Then Linux came out in the 90s. Uh, then Microsoft kind of tried to squash it, and then by 2010 yeah. or whatever, 2020, uh, open source is dominant. You know, so it took a couple of decades. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's uh, we've had 200 years of industrial culture that's uh, closed source, highly proprietary. So I think we're we're struggling with that because the agents who are actually doing it, they're all in the matrix. They're all in the network of proprietary mindset. Yeah. Whereas in software, there was there was a lot more of the awareness of open. Yeah. Say, yeah. Yeah. So, what are the reactions like when you go out into your own community? Like, what do people who people who aren't familiar with open source concepts like, and they just hear and see the numbers, right? Like, you can you can spell out the business case for this kind of stuff. Oh like, yeah. What's your reaction? They're like, oh yeah, that's it's like it kind of goes over their head. It's like yeah, yeah, that's can't oh, even yeah, imagine yeah, right. it. But you know, a lot of responses like, yeah, great ideas, and then but then you if you'd ask them to do it, and it's like. Oh no! I, I got my job, and I work for John Deere or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's the typical response. No, it's uh, it's amazing how, even from the entrepreneurs, I mean, just everybody. It's like very hard case to to sell at this point, be, and simply because yeah. not a not a single case in my view has been shown of a clear victory of open source. Even though it did happen already with three D printers, nobody noticed. Mm. I don't think anybody mm. noticed. Mm. Yeah. So three. So so. Uh, what do you mean by that? Like I didn't know this. Are, are most three oh. D printers based on open source uh, yes, design? So, yeah. So wow. the company, the company today that sells the largest number of printers, as far as I know, is Prusa three D printers. Uh, they're founded by Joseph Prusa, a guy who has the open source hardware logo tattooed on his arm. So, wow. Um, in in three D printers. Lulzbot was a major company. Um, they're kind of they actually got bought out recently, but um, MakerBot, which went proprietary, but so they kind of don't exist anymore. But but now today, the biggest biggest manufacturers are based on open source, and all the other cheap clones they're all based on open source. So I would say, I don't know the exact numbers, but the vast majority of printers, the consumer printers that you see out there, uh, either are open source or built upon the open source content that then they made proprietary. Um, so yeah, it's an example of a complete industry trans transformation starting about 2012 or so, or 20, whatever it was, 2008 when the patent ran out on the 3D printer. Um, so it's just like the, the steam engine in an industrial revolution. The patent ran out uh, from James Watt. A bunch of people started co-developing and they got the, the efficiencies to be twice as high within a decade or so. so as the historical example is a long time ago in the Industrial Revolution, but yes, the modern example is, is the 3D printer, but kind of nobody, uh, nobody really noticed that. Now, well, why not? Yeah, uh, why, why aren't people telling that story? It's an amazing story. That is absolutely right. And, and from my perspective, that blows me away that is not being covered. Mm -hmm. But I think the main reason is that it did not show the case of, okay, here's a company and here's like this amazing open collaboration and you get better products faster. It took time. It was definitely like the RepRap community is you know, completely disorganized. Uh, mm. Altogether, it moves forward because there's so many people working on it. And eventually, the top companies like Lulzbot and Prusa and Ultimaker, uh, Ultimaker is not open source, but they all came out of the, that work. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's actually one of those fascinating historical studies that, no, uh, uh, yeah, Silicon Valley is not paying attention to it, and 
why not is I don't know it's it, it should be I mean should be told a story that should be told yeah it, it, it's definitely a case so that's why uh, I mentioned the in incentive challenge so mm -hmm. so in summary they have delivered the best product but not on schedule uh, it took a long time it wasn't an effective efficient economically viable process um, so what we're trying to show with the incentive challenge for next year for September launching the cordless drill challenge is to show okay we've got a 10 billion dollar cordless drill industry and here's a, an incentive challenge that runs for six months thousands of people participate and we're gonna show that we can make the best the faster cheaper better drill and that we can get hundreds of people starting to produce them as small open source businesses as, as a we're looking at somewhat of a franchise model for that uh, everything is completely open source, radically transparent and collaborative. Uh, but we're trying to show that, okay, you can deliver product on but at one-tenth of the budget on the same time scale, i.e. this open product development simply works and that will get adopted by every single other industry once a few cases like that. We're hoping that with this case that makes human economic history and people start to actually notice that, okay, here's a product that was developed collaboratively it's yeah. better, cheaper, faster, cheaper development time uh, in terms of development effort, and as good or better than industry standards. Mm. So that's I mean, what it's, looking forward to that. It's definitely appealing from the standpoint of again, like I'm not a hard hardware guy, but I own a cordless drill, right? Like yeah. a lot of people own one, know what one is, like yeah. will need one around the house. So yeah. yeah, if you could pull that off, I can imagine that would create yeah. a lot of exposure. Great. And we selected that because it lends itself to 3D printing. There's a lot of a lot of 3D printers out there, so a lot of people can collaborate. But actually, we're doing a Steam Camps because part of that is how do you get a thousand or more people to collaborate effectively on a project, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you look at the video link that I sent you, I, mm -hmm. I in an hour I told the overview of how we think that can happen, and that's that's our experiment. So really cool, really cool. Yeah, really cool. yeah looking forward to watching that. Yeah. So, cool. huh? yeah. So, how do we collaborate? I mean, uh, since we use the word, we use the word that, or you, you have coined our favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. I had no idea. That's amazing. Yeah. No. Absolutely, That's man. Cool. That's we're all over that. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, like, what do you need? What are your? Well, I mean, it sounds like you need a lot. But what are? Yeah. What would you say? Oh, I don't know. Um, so, for one. Yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I was gonna say. So next year we're doing. I don't know. Maybe like if I could invite you here for. So we're, next year we're doing three months of summer of extreme design build. It's about collaborative development of of the kind of stuff that we build. But I don't know how we can rope you in. You, you work. I mean, you work. I mean, tell me more what you do. So you do like team building and scaling of how people work with collaborative literacy. I mean, tell me more about. I made a big shift over the past uh, past few years. I mean, for for a good chunk of my career, I was essentially a consultant. So people would hire me; they would have some specific challenge. It had to be something that was, um, you know, for the social good, right? And it had to be something I could talk about because if I can't talk about it, then I can't share what I'm learning. Um, but other than that, like I would, if, if it was a project that like sounded interesting and was consistent with my values, then I would work with whoever the client was and try and support them in doing whatever they were doing, um, and try to apply everything I was learning to, to creating success around that. So, um, like in 2009, 2010, I led the uh, Wikimedia uh, strategic planning process, right? So how do you do strategy work? Uh, like with a community that already has an open source ethic and knows how to collaborate with each other in an open way, but like doesn't necessarily no one even knows what strategy means, right? Or what strategic planning means, right? So how do you do that? And you know, um, across scale, I worked on like water issues in California. How do you get a group of stakeholders who like water is important? We don't have enough of it here, right? And people like are suing each other and hate each other like how do you get people to actually talk about with each other to try and um get to the constructive solutions right the win-win solutions are hard when you're talking about real scarcity but but how do you get as close as possible to that kind of thing 
and uh, so I was so for for many years I was doing you know doing this work and really enjoying it and learning a lot from it and, and feeling good about it and um, you know about I would say starting about like nine ish years ago and then six years ago I started to do with them about it I was realizing that number one I didn't get into this business to just help one group at a time. Right. I really want to see scale. Like I want to see like people in general get better at collaboration, and um, in order for that to have a possibility of even happening, like I needed to experiment with different models. Um, and then, like the bigger kind of challenge that I saw was that even on the projects that I was working on, even if we saw success, what I was noticing was after you know a, a few years after I would leave, like people would return to old habits. Like, the change wasn't sustainable. And that was problematic for me, right? Like, what you're trying to do is create, like, a large-scale shift in terms of how people collaborate more effectively. And so about six years ago, I left the firm that I co-founded to really focus on, like, how the models for how we do it at scale. And, you know, the thing I landed on was, I think, like, the mindset of a consultant and the mindset of people who hire consultants is almost counter to this very notion. Yeah. Part of which, like, even though, you know, I always had an open source ethic, like, I wasn't CC zeroing stuff before, but I was CC licensing everything I did, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Or if there was software that came out of it, it would always be, like, some open source license, right? So I, I tried to be even more aggressive in terms of removing barriers, like, when I left my company and started to think about, like, how to get people to adopt this stuff. But I really think what it boils down to is this notion of, of literacy, and everyone can develop that on literacy just through practice. I mean, it's like you, you have this amazing story. Like you didn't have a farming background or a manufacturing background, and mm -hmm. you've like obviously developed the skill to do this kind of work. Like It's possible, yeah. right? And I think with something like collaboration, which is different from farming or different from manufacturing or building or any of those things, because like we're all essentially human. Mm -hmm. We all, it's more like software from the standpoint of like, we already have the tools we need to get better at collaboration and to practice it. Yeah. And so what I'm really trying to do is I'm really just trying to like create a movement around like the way you get better is to be intentional around it and to practice it. And so I'm trying to develop like, um, like models and techniques and trainings and that kind of stuff and, and work with other people to really support them in in just developing the practices of how to get better at collaboration. Um, still haven't figured out the business model. I mean, you know, there's like, um, trainings are obviously one path. Um, I really think of it uh, similar to things like um, working out, like physical fitness. You know, physical fitness, hiring a consultant would be the equivalent of hiring like a personal fitness trainer, Yeah. right? Like if you hire someone good, it's good. But, like, that's not a sustainable, scalable model if, like, health required you to hire a personal fitness trainer. But we don't need that. I could go running with my neighbor, right? Or, you know, I can, like, watch a YouTube video on how to do push-ups and build core strength or do whatever. Like, there's a lot of, like, just free and open information out there if I'm, if I'm motivated enough. And then if I need support structures, there are things like gymnasiums. There's like all sorts of infrastructure that actually supports us in the practice. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to come up with like what's the infrastructure on the more scalable end that really supports people in developing practices to get better at collaboration. And if people are actually exercising, then they're going to get better. Right? You don't need to hire like a specialist to, to support you on that. What's what's um, your latest on? So are you, how are you doing financially? You don't have a you don't really have a good sustainable business model right now. So you're living <laughs> off savings or? Uh, so so initially when I got started, I was doing it on savings, and then for about like three ish years, I basically found different groups that was essentially like sponsoring the experiment. Right, so I would work with their groups, and I would like they would be my guinea pigs, and they would be paying me to basically do this. And they knew that anything I developed, like share for free, you know, CC zero, all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, and then, like, I've been like, you know, I've just been really challenged. Um, I wasn't finding model. I was finding certain like fundamental barriers to that. So I decided to stop doing that and to try 
developing like other ways of doing it. And so, like for the past year, it's largely been you know living off my savings again. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, you know, figure out models that work, and then you know go from there. So, how do you see, how do you see it going forward? Are you talking about like big clients like Google and Apple or whatever, whoever, or is it more like grassroots for you? Or I think at some point. Like, this, this is absolutely, like, larger companies are going to, like, want to do this, mm -hmm. right? I've talked to a lot of larger companies. It's interesting. People want to hire me to do things the way I used to do it, right? And I'm like, I've already seen this, you know, story play out, and tell me, I'm not going to do Can you tell me, tell me a little bit more about what played out before that you weren't so happy with? So, uh, a really common example. Um this is this is actually I would say this is common for for small companies as well, but but you really see this in larger company. So the large company they come come up to me. Um, they have a, a pretty toxic culture, like overall. They're about like you know ten ten thousand people. They're global, but actually like primarily like the bulk of the people is San Francisco engineering driven company. Um, really kind of toxic culture internally. Um, one of their divisions is having all sorts of problems at the leadership level, all sorts of just like group dysfunction. So the um, so the like the gut instinct that so many people have at like the corporate level when they're trying to like fix these problems is you hire a consultant and you like have a meeting, you do an offsite where you have like difficult conversations, right? And maybe you have a series of meetings around this and hopefully that solves all your problems, right? Mm -hmm. That never works. It's yeah. it's not that like having a conversation is not a bad thing. And in fact, everybody, not just large companies, but for the most part, most people can like serve to learn how to have like better, more functional meetings, right? Mm -hmm. But But even beyond that, like even if you have like difficult conversations with each other, the problem is almost always systemic. There's mm -hmm. something like within the organization that's structural, that's like poor habits and stuff like that. And if you don't change those things, like you can't fix the fundamental problems, mm -hmm. right? And so this is, I think, the the big difference between how I used to do it and how I'm trying to do it now, which is before how I used to do it. Like as a consultant, you have leverage because people are paying you a lot of money, right? Way more money than like the work you're doing is actually worth. Right. From the standpoint of like, it's worth it from the standpoint, like there's a market from it. But what's also interesting is I would find people within organization all the time who had the same skills that I did. It's just that nobody was listening to those people. Right. Oh, really? Because they didn't have the status. Uh -huh. Right. Um, but status is a powerful tool. So if they think if you're external and if they think you know something, even though they already have the knowledge internally, mm -hmm. they might actually listen to you, right? Mm -hmm. And what you essentially end up being is a very expensive way to force people to slow down and to take up space, right? And to actually have conversations that they otherwise wouldn't want to have and, you know, and that kind of stuff. And hopefully through that process, you start changing some habits, right? 